We now turn our attention to the fourth and final module of Physics of Life, wave phenomena. Wave phenomena encompass two disparate types of energy. The first is sound, which is a phenomenon of propagating pressure waves in some kind of elastic medium, like air, water, or solid materials. The second is electromagnetic radiation, which is a little bit more complicated than sound, but nevertheless also represents a phenomenon of energy being propagated in waves. We'll have more to say about where electromagnetic radiation comes from in a subsequent lecture. Wave phenomena, whether we're talking about sound or electromagnetic radiation, have much in common including that both are very rich media for the transmission of information. We see this in the remarkably sophisticated sensory systems for hearing, which involves sound, and vision, which involves one form of electromagnetic radiation, namely light. The very sophistication of these sensory systems for both hearing and vision speaks to the ability of both sound and light to convey information in the form of waves. Even though we'll be delving into the differences between sound and electromagnetic radiation, we will also be emphasizing their similarities, particularly when it comes to sensation and communication. Let's start with sound. In any kind of sensory system, we must have a transmitter of energy, in this case represented by a loudspeaker, and a receiver for energy, indicated in this instance by a person with ears. Sound is generated by the back-and-forth motion of the cone of the speaker, which imposes an oscillating force on the air, reduction of pressure as the cone pulls back, and compression of the air as the cone pushes forward. This alternating wave of compression and rarefaction is transmitted through the medium of air until it finally reaches the ears of the receiver. Even though we're drawing these waves as static, they are in fact moving forward through the air at some speed, abbreviated usually as c, with units of meters per second. The result is a traveling wave of compression alternating with rarefaction. If we put a pressure sensor next to our receiver's ears, and we plot the variation of pressure with respect to time, we see an up and down wave of alternating high pressure and low pressure. Note that we're plotting this as a pressure differential with respect to some base pressure so that the wave alternates around this base zero. Usually we can just assume the base pressure is the atmospheric pressure of the air. No matter whether we're talking about sound or electromagnetic radiation, both types of waves have similar characteristics. The first we've already encountered, namely the speed of propagation of the wave. This is conventionally symbolized with a C. For both sound and electromagnetic radiation, speed of propagation is denominated with units of meters per second. Any wave will have a certain period, symbolized with an uppercase P. The units of period are seconds per cycle. Waves also have a length, called the wavelength, which is conventionally symbolized with a lowercase lambda, with units of meters per cycle. Wavelength is the product of the speed of propagation, c, in meters per second, and the wave period in units of seconds per cycle. Work out the units for wavelength yourself. The wave period can be calculated as the ratio of the wavelength with units of meters and the speed of propagation in meters per second. Again, work out those units yourselves. Wave frequency is another characteristic of waves, which is how many cycles can be packed into one second. It has units of inverse seconds. Frequency is also simply the inverse of period and is calculated as the ratio of speed of propagation and wavelength. Frequency is also denominated by a special unit, the hertz, which is one cycle per second. Finally, there's the amplitude, which embodies the energy contained in the wave. The amplitude is the magnitude of the up and down oscillation of the wave. In the case of sound, the amplitude has units of pascals, which means that the energy term is embodied in a pressure. We'll come to the energy in light in a subsequent lecture. Let's put some figures on sound amplitude. 
sound amplitudes are very small pressures compared to the atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure is typically on the order of 100 kilopascals or so. A light rustling sound, in contrast, has an amplitude of only 60 micropascals. And quiet conversation has an amplitude of 20 to 200 millipascals. If you're on a noisy construction site, the sound amplitude is still quite small, only 2 pascals. A sound amplitude sufficient to cause pain in the ears is about 30 times larger than this, but the pressure oscillation is still only about 60 pascals. Finally, if you're standing about 30 meters from a jet engine, you're experiencing an amplitude on the order of 600 pascals. The energy intensity of a wave function depends upon the amplitude. In the case of sound, amplitude is pressure. There's another way of expressing amplitude, however, and this is with a quantity known as the decibel. Let's look at a wave with amplitude A. The decibel measures amplitude with reference to some reference amplitude, A sub zero. And here's the formula for decibel. You can see that it depends upon a ratio of the amplitude to some reference amplitude, A sub zero. This reference amplitude would be some smaller wave. Note that A sub zero is still a pressure with units of pascals. This raises the obvious question, what is the reference amplitude? Depending upon the context, the reference amplitude may differ, which can make the decibel a bit of a confusing measure. By convention, there's an agreed upon standard physical reference. For sound in air, the reference amplitude is one micropascal. In water, the standard reference is 20 micropascals. Okay, that's pretty simple. The confusion comes in because people sometimes use a different reference amplitude. In auditory systems, for example, the reference amplitude is the minimum audible sound intensity, which varies with frequency. We're more interested, though, in how the decibel compares to other measures of sound intensity. So, for comparison, here's our light rustling sound with an amplitude of 60 micropascals. Work out the math. Assuming a reference amplitude of 1 micropascal, the decibel value for a light rustling sound is a little under 18 decibels. Quiet conversation at a minimum amplitude of 20 millipascals has a decibel value of 33 decibels. Turning to the maximum amplitude for quiet conversation with an amplitude of 200 millipascals, 10 times higher, the decibel value is 43 decibels. So you can begin to see how the decibel measure works. An amplitude that is 10 times larger, that is 200 versus 20 millipascals, produces a decibel difference of 10. There's an additional complication to the decibel measure, however. Here's an expanded version of our sound wave. Sound, being pressure, is a form of potential energy, and wherever there's potential energy, there's the potential to do work. The oscillating sound pressure can do work, which is proportional to the area under the curve. Work can be expressed as the square of a pressure over a quantity known as the impedance, Z. We'll be coming back to impedance later. For now, suffice it to say that impedance is a kind of resistance energy flow, like the resistance in an electrical circuit, but one that applies specifically to wave phenomena. This work can also be expressed as a decibel value, using a formula that's similar to that for amplitude. Like for amplitude, the decibel value for work is calculated with reference to a standard, P sub zero. However, work is proportional to the square of the pressure, which makes for this formula. Now, the decibel value is equal to 20 times the logarithm of the ratio of pressure squared over the reference pressure squared. So far, we've been framing our discussion in terms of sound energy, because that's actually quite easy to understand. Amplitude and the decibel formulation of amplitude covers one way we can express variation of intensity, and we can apply it to both sound and electromagnetic waves. However, waves also vary in the time dimension, which includes things like wavelength, frequency, and period, anything with a dimension of time.
To characterize variation in the time dimension, we have to use a different tool, the spectrum. Let's start with the spectrum of sound, which has a speed through air of about 343 meters per second. We can plot a spectrum for sound energy as a function of frequency. Rather than expressing frequency as cycles per second, or inverse seconds, we use the more convenient designation of hertz. One hertz is one cycle per second. Sound varies in frequency. Of interest to us is only a limited range of frequencies from less than 10 hertz on the low end up to in excess of 22 kilohertz at the high end. This is because the range of frequencies that are conventionally held to be audible to the human ear is shown here in blue, which by convention extends from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. For some people, the range of audible frequencies can extend down to as low as 16 hertz and as high as 22 kilohertz at the higher end of the audio spectrum. Sound that is above the maximum frequency for human hearing, that is greater than 20 kilohertz, is known generically as ultrasound. At the other end of the spectrum, sound frequencies less than 20 hertz are designated infrasound. The wavelengths of these various sounds are quite interesting, and if we know the speed of sound, we can calculate them. At the low end of our spectrum, at an infrasound frequency of 10 hertz, the wavelength of a sound wave is nearly 35 meters. As frequency increases, the wavelength obviously will decrease. At the low end of the audible spectrum, at 20 hertz, the wavelength is still very large, slightly more than 17 meters. As we go to higher and higher frequencies, the wavelengths obviously decline down to only 17 millimeters at a frequency of 20 kilohertz. For those with a musical ear, middle C on the piano keyboard, or C sub 3 as it's commonly designated, corresponds to a frequency of 250 hertz. A above middle C, or A sub 4, is sometimes used as a standard tone. This note has a frequency of 440 hertz. Make a note of this number. You'll see this in what's to come. And what about electromagnetic radiation, which has a much faster propagation speed of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second? The electromagnetic spectrum is much broader than per sound, with the frequencies varying over more than 13 orders of magnitude. As with sound, the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation are quite interesting and fun to calculate. At a frequency of 1 megahertz at the far left of our spectrum, the wavelength is nearly 300 meters. At the far right of the spectrum, at frequencies of 10 to the 16th to 10 to the 18th hertz, wavelengths are down to lengths of a few nanometers. Being so wide, the electromagnetic spectrum can be divided into several different bands, or brackets of frequencies. At the high end are the very energetic gamma rays, shown in red, and X-rays, shown in light purple. Working our way down the spectrum, ultraviolet radiation follows next, shown here in darker purple. There's a considerable span of wavelengths that fall into the so-called infrared band, which is itself divided into subbands of the so-called near-infrared, shown here in light yellow, and far-infrared, shown here in orange. At lower frequencies still are the microwaves, shown in darker orange. These include frequencies for radar, as well as the microwaves that are used to cook your food. At still smaller frequencies is a band assigned to broadcast media, both radio and television, shown in red. And then down at the extreme lower end are the so-called long wave frequencies, shown in dark blue. These correspond to the background electromagnetic radiation that is a remnant of the Big Bang. And last but not least, there's the visible end of the spectrum, shown in green, which encompasses a very narrow proportion of this total electromagnetic spectrum, spanning a range of just a few hundred nanometers in wavelength, from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. This raises an interesting question. Why is it that the visible wavelengths are confined to such a narrow band of a much larger electromagnetic spectrum? We can put the question another way. Why should the sensory organs for vision be confined to such a narrow band of the spectrum? We'll come to answer both of these questions as we proceed through the lecture.